so now the second half we're going to really start diving into some of the active shooter events that have occurred throughout the United States. We're going to kind of dissect them and look at what and put in place what Deputy Spooner just told you this morning about disaster response and try to get into the ADD as well. So like any good class we have to have a definition of what an active shooter event is. So an active shooter event is an attempted mass murder. Don't get caught up on the shooter word, okay? It does not have to be anything with a firearm or a gun. It could be somebody crashing a truck into a group of bystanders. It could be someone putting a van in front of a school depository and blowing it up. It could be like most people don't realize a few days after Las Vegas there's 31 people killed with a knife in Taiwan. So don't get caught up on the word shooter. It doesn't have to be with a firearm. And I believe the actual FBI definition is over there with Deputy Spooner. The federal definition of active shooter is one or more persons actively engaged in killing or attempting to kill people in a confined and populated area. Confined and populated area, very important. The shooter, there is no profile for the shooter. It could be male, female, young, old, any ethnic background, any, any background of, of money or poor. It does not matter. There is no profile. They all have the Avenger mindset. They feel that they have been wronged in some way, shape, or form, whether they have or not, and they are going to take matters into their own hands, and they're going to uh, harm as many people as they possibly can. Some broadcast it. This is very important because, I, as I told you before, I worked in a school, so they, what kids do is they talk. They talk about things. And anybody that's playing in these, you know, there's Facebook, there's Instagram, there's Snapchat, there's all these things social media-wise. Um, there's pictures. Heck, Columbine High School, those kids actually made a video of what they were going to do for film class. Nobody said anything. Okay, and the reason why I bring it, why it gets brought up this way, is because the one thing that these individuals, when they've made up their mind that they want to break the record, so to speak, and kill as many people to get their name in lights, the one thing they don't want to do is fail, feel of uh, fear of failure, and once you confront them and start doing that, now they have that fear of failure, so it's important. If you're at church, if you're at work, if you're somewhere at school or whatever, and someone says something or, again, that gut instinct kicks in, um, you need to say something. Get us involved. Get someone involved because now that they realize we're paying attention to what they've said and done. And that's what I used to impress upon all my faculty and staff at the school I worked in is make sure that we're saying something about it because it and it's really hard to figure out how many we've prevented but we sure know the ones we miss so because it's we don't want to be the ones on the five o'clock news saying well you know three weeks ago okay we don't want to say that we want to be on top of things and cut it off at the pass before it becomes an issue the next slide that you're about to see is not in any way shape or form a political slide. This is to show you the occurrence of these uh, mass attempted mass murders throughout the United States from 2000 to 2014. They will begin to populate the map up here. You can make whatever determination you want out of this map. Um, there are small dots that will appear. Our zero of the four people were shot or killed or harmed or killed. Um, the medium-sized dots are 5 to 9, and the big ones are 10 plus. Um, I'm going to let, actually, I think I can populate it. So as they pop up, they're going to pop up as they occurred throughout the years. So as the years go on, you will see they begin to pop up pretty frequently. Um, a lot of people refer to this as the popcorn slide because it kind of starts popping like popcorn. Um, again, make whatever determination you want out of this slide. But for 14 years, in which we usually like to say at this point that 14 years, this information is just about four years old. It's already out of date. 
and usually any training you do four years is, is a pretty good uh, amount of time for data, but unfortunately these things are happening. So basically at this point there's been 179 in 14 years. How many of those have we heard about? Not all of them, correct? All right, so, and a lot of people then now tell me at this point that they're either moving to Montana or Maine. All right, so just so you know, so you kind of have an idea, I'm going to Montana. Deputy Spooner's going to Maine because he likes lobster. So, um, depending on which one you want to hang out with, it's cool. Uh, this map is really not here to scare you. It's to show you that the frequency of how they're occurring and to be prepared for anything to happen at any point in time. Because uh, 179 in 14 years, if it can happen in a one-room schoolhouse in Amishville, Pennsylvania, it can happen anywhere we are. Okay, We have to be on our game. Location of where these attacks occur, as you can see, just over 50% is your commerce areas. Schools barely break 25, 25%. <laughs> Most people think this is a school issue. It's not, it's general public. It's where you're doing your shopping. It's where you're going to church. It's where you're going to your, your concerts. It's where you're going to your mall, grocery shopping. All those locations is well over 50% of the time is where they occur. Don't get hung up that it's just a school issue. It's everywhere issue. Shooter connection to the actual location kind of staggering. A lot of people would think that there's a lot of connection to the area where this person is doing it. No, probably about 50% of the time they actually have a connection to the location. Um, so it doesn't matter that they're upset at A and B church, but they want to go where the population is, so they may go do, I don't know, a concert because there's a lot of people or a big gr group of people. And it's like I say at schools, most of the time at schools, when is the, your biggest threat for something like this to happen? It's at dismissal time, it's at when they're uh, arriving, and then at any kind of uh, lunch or place where they're grouping, like a pep rally or something like that. So we always have to be paying attention. A lot of people don't realize that even the shooter at um, Sandy Hook Elementary School Yes, his mother did work at Sandy Hook, but that was not his original target. His original target was the high school because he could have got more kids in a populated area. He wanted to break the record. His mother did work there. He saw the resource officer on campus decided at the high school decided to go to where there was nobody to stop him from doing what he was doing. So it goes back to they don't want that fear of failure. So now we're going to get into a few things that you probably have heard before. Two, Fort Hood, Texas, 2009. What actually happened here, Deputy Spooner? 2009, Fort Hood, Texas. Officers Kim Munley and Mark Todd uh, were the officers that stopped the shooting. There was one shooter, 13 were killed, 30 were injured. Interesting thing, the two officers that were involved in the neutralization of the shooter taught this exact class. Chattanooga, Tennessee, 2015. Chattanooga, Tennessee, 2015. This was at a military recruiting office in Chattanooga. The uh, gunman opened fire at the military recruiting office and fled in a vehicle. He drove north to the uh, and crashed through the gates at the um, Naval Operations Center. And also about seven miles outside of Chattanooga, he murdered four Marines and one Naval, Naval Petty Officer before Chattanooga police neutralized him. Trivia time. What, what uh, phrase or term, phrase I guess, was coined from this incident? This was, at, this was at the post office or postal facility. A postal employee killed 14 wounded six before he killed himself. That's where we get the term going postal. Now, 1986 well before 1999 Columbine High School. What this shows you is this is not a new problem. This is not something that's new, that's just a new phenomenon that's popping up. It's ha happening a little bit more frequently now, but if you really want to hit your history books, and I challenge you to do so, because it's pretty cool, but 
Um, if you look, your first active shooter in a school was in the 1800s. Again, this is not a new phenomenon. It's just happening more frequently. So it's not something new that anybody just made up. It's something happening. So 1986, well before Columbine High School. Now, basically, the number of deaths are attributed to two things. How quickly law enforcement arrives on scene and target availability. Okay, so how much we can limit the shooter for the targets available to them. Okay, who here can tell me the national average for law enforcement response to an active shooter? Any ideas? National average now. So we're talking like we got some places like, well, not Montana. I can't say that. But other places that have had these incidents that are like in the rural areas. Then we have places in the cities and we have resource officers on campuses. So national average, think about that. Five, eight, six. You can't actually think that law enforcement officers are going to get there any quicker than three minutes. How much can happen in three minutes? So it's very important that we establish, avoid, deny, defend, and limit target availability to the individual try, individuals you know, trying to do harm. Who's ever heard of the crime triangle? Every crime that occurs has three elements. Only one can we control. Every crime has to have the offender's ability to commit the crime. Can we, can we effectively control someone's abilities? I can't physically change someone's physical ability to do something. The second element is their desire to commit the crime. Can I change somebody's mind and what they want to do? No. The third element of our triangle or our bottom piece is their opportunity, availability, <coughs> target availability. Can we control that? Yes. yes, we can. That's what we're going to talk about in our civilian response. Now, obviously, first of all, we don't want to deny that we just heard gunshots. We want to get past this part of the response to a, to a disaster as quickly as we can. Our gut says those were gunshots. Our brain follows along and says, yep, those were gunshots. Are we, do, we, do we need to, to dispute that back and forth anymore? Nope. No. The only thing we might need to decide is where did they come from? What direction did they come from? We want to get to our deliberation. This is Christina Anderson. Christina Anderson was a student at Virginia Tech University. She is going to give us an account of what happened to her during the first Virginia Tech shooting. There have been two. This was during the first one. She's going to discuss what transpired play-by-play -play in the room that she was in. We're going to look at some of the things that she says. You see it says playing dead. We're going to discuss that and dis discuss if that's a good option for us to use in a situation. So this is pretty important. This day, I ended up sitting in exactly the same seat I always did, in the back right-hand corner on the right side of the class. What we don't know is at this time, someone is downstairs, and he's chaining all three doors shut. There's supposed to be desks there. All you guys can see. We heard the first gunshots outside in the hallway, and my teacher, she opened the door. She immediately slammed it, and she said, call 911. And the second that door closed, he walks in. He walks in shooting. There's absolutely no time. He goes to the other side of the classroom by the windows. He's holding two guns. He doesn't say anything. He just starts going down the rows of people. It's very quick, it's very loud, it's very scary. We had these very shitty desks. I get on the floor, I put my knees under the chair, my stomach on the seat, hands over head, eyes are closed. 
as the shots keep going, and it's, like I said, very loud, I can tell it's getting closer and closer. And I'm telling myself, brace yourself, your turn is gonna come. Now, I didn't know what that meant. Like, I didn't think I was gonna get shot, but I knew that something really serious was going on. And I knew for whatever reason that I should just play dead. He shoots me. The first time's in the back. And you'd be surprised, getting shot doesn't hurt that much because shock overtakes you, but it starts to like burn and really kind of seep in and that's when it gets really uncomfortable. Um, it's not pleasant. He leaves the first time, he goes across the hall, and while he's gone, cell phones are ringing, people are coughing, and the smell of gunpowder has like completely filled the room. Gunpowder is like this really sticky, pungent, warm smell, and it just makes you very, very thirsty. He comes back. Now, this time, the shooting is more intermittent. It's slower because he's looking to see who's alive. I remember telling myself to stop breathing because I can feel my stomach hitting that chair, and I'm saying, stop, like, he can see that you're alive. The third and final time, he killed himself in front of our classroom. When the police broke in, the first thing the guy said was, we have a lot of blacks in here. I didn't know what that meant, but when police sweep a crime scene, they have 30 seconds. If you're red, you're critically injured. If you're yellow, you'll live. Black means you're dead. In nine minutes, he killed 11 of my classmates and my teacher. 32 people lost their lives that day. Christina Anderson was shot three times playing dead. So we're going to discuss if that's a good strategy. Did, did playing dead work for her? No. She's alive. I mean, but playing dead is basically what we have here, hiding and hoping. If, if you've pinned yourself down to one location and you cannot do anything else to protect <laughs> yourself, that's what you're left with is hiding and hoping. Hoping that your hiding place is good enough to not be found, and if you are found, bad doesn't come to you. Remember in the video that we watched, the 15 minute video at the beginning, they discussed the difference between concealment and cover. This podium here provides excellent concealment. Concealment is nothing more than me taking this, and placing it into my pocket. It is concealed from your sight, but it is not pro provided any type of cover. There's nothing protecting it other than the, the fabric of my pants. Any modern ammunition will penetrate that podium, will penetrate these tables, these chairs, these doors, because these items provide concealment. Items that provide cover, the engine block of a car, three, the quarter to half inch plate steel, a grandfather oak tree, things of that nature, things that are going to stop a bullet, those provide cover. Cover is better than concealment. Concealment just helps you hide from the situation. Once we've gotten past the denial phase, we get to deliberation. That's where we implement our avoid, our denial, and our defend. This deny is different from denying that there's a problem, okay? We're going to watch a video from 2010 that comes to us from Panama City, Florida. It's a school board meeting. A gentleman comes into the school board meeting with some bad things on his mind. I guess his wife got terminated from her job as a school bus driver in that county and he's looking for some answers. Now, in the video, you're going to hear a noise and hear kind of a little scuttle in the, the audience about, oh, oh, ah. What's going on, and you'll see, is this guy has, has gone to the podium set up on the side of the room, taken out a can of red spray paint, painted a big V with a circle around it on the wall. It comes from a movie, V for Vendetta, it's an anarchist type movie. And then he pulls out a gun. He tells, tells the group, and some of the audio is difficult, so I'm going to explain it before we see it tells the group, everybody in the room except you guys behind the counter, leave. Okay? Let's watch the video and we're going to pause it and discuss certain things as they come along. And for the technology to notice it's on the uh, chart that you have there and it's part of it. 
plans that we have that the workshop we're going to have following this meeting, but uh, this will be the first step in that whole process. I have a motion. Oh, uh, motion. Okay. Everybody in this room. Uh, All right, we heard what he said, right? We heard everybody in this room except you behind the counter leave, and we see he's got a gun in his right hand, right? Ladies, what do you have in that purse that's worth your life? Well, we all agree that everybody sitting out in this side of the, in the, the audience, so to speak, they were given a void, were they not? They were given their first option in our response, were they not? If you are given that option, unless you have the keys to the vault at Fort Knox in that purse, leave it. Get up and get out. You were given that. Hey, sir. John, John, just let him talk. He's, he's, he's talking. John, go ahead. I'm gonna die today. You hear what he just said? I'm gonna to die today. I've already been the person. Can I ask you a question? I've already been the person. Can I ask you a question? Because I really don't know who you're talking about, to be very honest with you. I have no idea who you're talking about. She was fired. I believe that because she said that, but what did she do? Come on, Anna. My. Can you just talk to us a little bit about it? Where did she where did she work at school? Just tell me some help. No, he's hey, how you doing? Oh, I guess you're the one with the cops. Come on in. Now I'm the school safety officer. Oh, come on in. You got a real down there? Come on in. Nah, we're gonna wait, man. He probably doesn't even have a gun. Tell me what she did. They're calling the police in as we speak. I know that, but tell me. You're part of it. Part of what? Sir, I don't know what you ran in just to stop taxes, okay? You said we don't need no taxes. No, the plenty of money. Then as soon as you got in the school system, then you turned around and said, oh, now we need to have some sales tax again. I said we needed to have some sales tax from the very beginning. I, I campaigned on that. Oh, yes, I did. You can find, you can look on the material. I said from the beginning, the half cent sales tax is the most equitable way because everybody pays it, not just property owners. Let me see. But here's what I don't want to happen. I don't want anybody to, listen, just listen to me for a minute. I don't want anybody to get hurt, and I, I've got a feeling that what you want is the cops to come in and kill you because you're you're mad, because you said you're going to die with that. But why? If this, is, this isn't worth it. This is a problem. Please don't. Please don't. Please. I'm going to get you. Don't you understand? He missed everybody. Okay? He was point blank range and missed everybody. However, the problem that I have with that is this guy in his right mind. Do you think a condescending comment like, I think what you want is the cops come in here and kill you. He was doing pretty good up until then. 
you know, it, this isn't worth it, this, you know, trying to rationalize. But was that maybe the best course of dialogue to choose with that individual? Probably not. Now remember I said that was Ginger, we're going to get back to her? She kind of felt like she was going to break that social proof and she was going to take action and defend, right? Was she committed to her actions? Not really. She hit him once. Did she follow up with anything? Did anybody in that panel help her out? She broke the social proof, but nobody followed along with her, did they? <clears throat> the only reason she didn't is because the guy didn't want to shoot her. So the first stage of our response to a situation, if at all possible, we want to avoid that situation. We want to leave ASAP. That's as soon as possible, not as soon as we gather our belongings. If we are given the opportunity to avoid the situation, do so immediately. By doing so, you want to make sure you know your exits. That's why we want to train you to think when you go into a store or go into a business or a building of whatever the, the nature of it is, look around, look for the exits. Know where your secondary and the primary exits to, a, to an establishment are at. And then, when you have exited the location and you're in a safe location, then call 911. That is when you give the information that you know. Remember in the video they said, tell only what you know, don't guess. If you don't know the answer to the question, it's perfectly all right to say, I don't know. Because sometimes having bad information is worse than having no information. Know your secondary exits. Remember I said windows are exits too? Don't limit your exits to just doors. If you're in a situation where it's a life or death situation, there is no off-limit exit. Cuts heal. Broken bones from jumping out of a second story window will heal. <coughs> Give yourself every opportunity you have. If you are unable to avoid the situation, we want to deny access to where we're at. These are outswing doors. Let me look at these doors real quick. These doors have small windows on them. I'm going to close this one just for... These are what we call outswing doors. They swing out of the room. Can we barricade, well, first of all, can we lock those doors from where we're at right now? There are no thumb locks for a deadbolt or anything like that. Unless you have a sp the specific key required, you can't necessarily lock those doors. We can't. Can we turn the lights off to the room? The answer to that is yes, I've been turning them on and off all day. If you want me to show you how, I'll be glad to. Can we get out of sight of that door? Sure we can. Sure we can. If somebody looks through that window, can they see me right now? Unless they can see through the wall, then they can't see me. If they can see through the wall, I've got bigger issues. <clears throat> but unless, if I, if I can get out of sight of that door, the lights are off, the door is somehow locked or barricaded, and they can't see me. Remember the goal? As many victims as they can find? Are they going to be wasting time trying to get into locked rooms that they don't know what's behind that door? Probably not. How do we barricade that door, though? We can't lock it. Can we all take these tables and stack them up in front of that door? Is that going to be effective? I open the door, I pull it towards me. Oh, there's tables in front of it. Poke my head over them, poke my head under them. Does that keep me from getting, it may keep me from getting into the room? but does it keep me from getting that door open? If that were an in-swing door where the door swings inward, this works perfect, barricades. Put heavy objects in front of it where you can't push it open. The more you put, the better. You take a door stop, shove it under the bottom of the door, put a couple heavy tables in front of it. It takes some pretty brute force to push that open. Outswing doors, this is what we're talking about. What do we have now that we can prevent that door from being open from in here? A belt. How are we going to use our belt? Well, if we take a belt, 
or a purse strap or a backpack strap or whatever we have, shoestrings if that's all we have, and we wrap around this, this scissor-like door opener here, if it can't open, if this can't expand, the door can't open. Another way we can use our belt, we see down on the bottom there, I don't know if you can see the picture really well, but the gentleman's got his belt around the door handle, pulled around the side using the door jam as leverage. So if somebody tries to pull it from the outside, who's gonna win that tug of war? Probably the guy using leverage in a belt around the corner of the, the door post. Now, what other things can, can we use? You guys now are kind of filling your toolbox, okay? So now you have the opportunity to think about where you work, where you spend most of your time at. Where would you be where you would be concerned about a situation like this happening? If you're at work, look at the doors to your office. Identify what type of doors you have, what type of things are there, and start putting that plan together, put that thought process together. What am I going to do? There are things sold commercially that are made to slide over those door closers. They're made of metal. There's, there's a market out there now to barricade doors. Can you put a piece of rope in your office if you don't want to spend the money for a piece of a, a commercially made thing? Can you put what they call a tactical cinch or a, a special piece of web material? Since I've been doing this for two years, like Jason said, we do a lot of research. We kind of try to keep up on what's out there, what's going on. I saw something on the, it was actually on Facebook a couple months ago. Um, a teacher in a classroom said, I went to a class and I want to know how to barricade or how to fortify my classroom to keep the kids in my classroom safe. So she came up with an idea. She took a, an eye bolt, where it had like the lag screw end, drilled a hole into the concrete wall and put a lead anchor in there, screwed the lag bolt in, pretty secure took an, a, a stretch of aircraft cable, looped it through the eye bolt, and put clamps on it so it was secure to that bolt, eye bolt. The other portion has a loop on it that will fit over top of the door handle, so when the door is closed and that piece of aircraft cable is over the door, that door can only open a couple of inches. Nobody's ever going to be able to force that door open and break that aircraft cable. That's thousands and thousands of pounds it takes to break that aircraft cable. Is it somewhat crude? Maybe. Is it going to be effective? Absolutely. But that's something that you can do now is think in advance. What if I have to barricade myself in this room to keep somebody from getting to me? What can I do? <clears throat> Now's the time to think of it, not if or when an incident occurs. <laughs> And once we get past the denying access to our location, we have to defend ourselves. We, we got that legal right to defend ourselves. Our life is in jeopardy. Others' lives are in jeopardy. We have a legal right and obligation, if you ask me, to defend ourselves and defend each other. When, when we want to, remember I said when I'm at a restaurant, I want to see that door. I want that advantage. I want to see them before they see me. If I'm standing alongside this door, this wall, and there's a door right where that screen's at, Who's going to see who first? I've got the advantage because they have to break the plane of that wall before they can see what's down this wall. So I see them coming in before they see me against the wall. Now, it says to grab the gun. Who in here is comfortable grabbing a gun from somebody? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not joking with this. I'm, I'm not going to tell you to do something that you're not comfortable with. I don't know what your physical abilities are. Personally, am I comfortable doing it? If it means it's giving me a better chance of survival, absolutely. But what does it say at the end? It says fight. Are there rules in a fight? No. no. Th there is one rule in the fight. Win. Because odds are if you lose, you might not go home. Now remember in that video they talked about vulnerable areas the eyes, the throat, the groin area. If we target those areas in a physical altercation where we're at in law enforcement, if we're in a fight and we punch somebody in the throat or kick them in the groin 
or gouge their eyeballs out, we had better be justified in using deadly force. We had better be justified in pulling our firearm and shooting them. That's what deadly force is. Those are deadly force areas. They're red in our use of force continuum. But remember, this isn't just somebody's being mean and took your parking spot. This is a fight for your life. They, they are armed with some weaponry, whether it's a gun, a knife, a car, whatever the case may be. Your life is in jeopardy. You want to win. And by win, you want to go home. There are no rules. What do we have in this room? Now, this is out of play and his is out of place. So you can't come take my gun to defend us. But what do we have in this room that we can use to defend ourselves from a would-be attacker? Chairs. chairs the, podium. the podium. I mean, the, the metal folding chairs up there. I mean, if, if, if you watched enough wrestling, you know those are pretty, pretty, pretty good weapons, right? I don't see a fire extinguisher in here, but fire extinguishers are great weapons. They're two-part weapons. If you spray a fire extinguisher in somebody's face, guess what? They can't see. They can't breathe. You can't see, you can't breathe, you can't fight. And when that fire extinguisher is empty, guess what else you have? Something that will go upside somebody's head and probably knock them out. It's an impact weapon and a chemical weapon. Back there on the back wall, usually there's two flags in a, in a room. And right here, usually we have the American flag that has an eagle on top and the state of Florida flag that has a spearhead on top. We don't have one in this room, but that's kind of like a spear, right? The, the stick that that flag's on, the one in the back. Remember in the video, they showed people picking up laptops, but they showed something really good. Somebody picked up a coffee pot. What's in that coffee pot? Hot coffee. Who's ever turned a coffee pot over on themselves and gotten scalded by that hot coffee? That will take the fight right out of you. The, the object is, do you want to maybe pour the coffee on them or just hit them in the face with the pot and hit them with, you know, hope the pot breaks and whatever. Whatever the case may be, use what you have at your disposal. And think about that when you're in your office or in your school or your church or in your whatever uh, building you're in. People bring up the thing all the time, bring up, well, what about wasp spray? We hear wasp spray works well. Understand that's a chemical agent. What does it do to a wasp as soon as it touches it? It kills it. If you are in a fight for your life and your life is in jeopardy, can we use wasp spray? Absolutely. If somebody took your parking spot at Publix, do we want to use the wasp spray on them? <laughs> no. Don't forget, too, that research has also shown that most of these individuals that are doing these attacks are not expecting to have any resistance whatsoever. Therefore, just throwing a chair, a book, or something at them to take them out of their game, it may just give you that, that you know, sneaky surprise to where it kind of stops them and then you got that little opportunity to actually take advantage of that situation. So, You take them off their game, you stun them, now their plan has been foiled and they've got to, they've got to start recalculating like the Tom Tom in your car. It's got to recalculate and rethink about what it needs to do. That's your opportunity to take, take advantage. If, if you do have somebody that decides that they're going to fight and they take action, that group, that social proof needs to take effect and everybody needs to get in on that. More, the, the more hands on deck, the better the chances. Now, this is Lieutenant Brian Murphy. He um, was a lieutenant with a law enforcement agency up in the north and he responded to a call of a gunman at a religious uh, building and when he got there he was met with an individual that was carrying I believe it was AK-47 and saw him and well that took his attention away from what he was doing. He starts shooting at this lieutenant and he shoots him 12 to 15 times. He's alive. I would encourage you to look up Lieutenant Brian Murphy on YouTube and listen to his account of what happened. Listen to his account of kind of, I mean, you see what he says here. He says, I'm not going out in a parking lot. 
I'm not going out like this. I'm not going to let my wife down. I'm not going to let my daughter down. I'm not going to let my stepkids down. In his interview, in the middle of this situation, this gunfight, the only thing he's thinking of is, man, my wife is going to be so mad at me because we're supposed to go to Florida. So he's thinking, I got to make it. Remember, Christine Anderson got shot three times. She's alive. He got shot 12 to 15 times. I might even be off on the number. I can't, I can't remember the exact number. He's alive. What does that tell us? He, he did have a vest on, but he's getting shot with an AK-47. That, that, <laughs> unless, he's, unless he's wearing a rifle plate, which are very bulky and very uncomfortable, and patrol guys don't tend to wear those, that's... These vests are not going to stop an AK-47 round. Aren't the bullets like that that come out of them? Mm, they're not quite that big, but they're, they're pretty good size, and they come out pretty, uh, with, with quite a bit of velocity. He got hit in the neck. You see the scar there. That goes to tell us that just because you're hit does not mean that you're dead. That tells us that you have to have the will to live, the, the desire to survive this situation. So now we're going to get back into... Virginia Tech. This is Norris Hall. This is where the incident occurred. Now remember Christina said that they were in their classroom on the second floor and there was, the gunman was chaining the doors downstairs. Why do you think he was chaining these doors right here? Whoop, whoop, whoop. Is it so they couldn't get out or so people couldn't get in? They chained them from the inside because what, what, what does he now know? The gunman now know. But how much time does he have? What's that national average? Three minutes. three minutes. So how can he increase his three minutes? Chaining the door shut, right? So that's why that happened. So this is the second floor. And these are the classrooms here. Not over there on the wall over here. Um, the red is the hallway. These are the classrooms. 211 is where Christina was at. And these are the other classrooms that were occupied at the time of the shooting. We are going to look room by room at what happened. Now we're going to start off in room 206. Room 206 is where the shooting started. The shooter walked in and started killing people right away. He left and returned later and shot more people. And as you can see there, you got about 92% killed or um, shot and then um, about 76% killed. Now these are percentages. We don't have the exact number of students that were in the classroom, but these are just the percentages per classroom. 211, this is where Christina Anderson was at. 211, the teacher heard the shots, told the students to call 911. Students attempted to block the door of the desk, but the shooter pushed his way in anyways, shot the professor, walked down the aisles, killing students. The shooter also returned later and shot more students in that room. 100% 100 of the people in that room were shot, and about 65% uh, were killed. Room 207. 207 was the second room attacked. The shooter walked in, shot several students and the teacher. He then walked down the aisle shooting more students. The shooter left. The shooter attempted to return. The students used their bodies to barricade the door. The shooter got the door open by about one inch. Also shot several shots into the door knob area, but no one was hit by those shots. About 85% were shot in that room, and about 38% were killed. Room 204. 204, where Professor Livio Labriscu was a Holocaust survivor. He held the door shut while the shooter tried to enter. Labriscu yelled to his students to jump out of the second-story windows. The shooter shot Labriscu through the door, killing him. Ten students made it out of the windows before the shooter got in. Two more were shot trying to get out. Both of them survived. Of six who did not get out, four were shot. One of those died. As you can see, a dramatic um, decrease there. Uh, about 35% of the room was shot, and about 12% were killed. What did we hear about the professor? Has he seen some things in his life? Do you think he might have had a plan together? If, I mean, he's block, barricading the door. He's... he's Trying to, trying to deny access. He's telling the students to jump out the window, so he's telling them to avoid while he's denying. He paid the ultimate price by getting shot through the door, but it wasn't for a, for a lack of trying, now was it? 
Let's see what happened in 205. 205. Students heard the shot, used their feet to keep the door closed. The shooter pushed on the door uh, and fired through the door, but never gained entry. No one shot, no one killed. Okay, now, we're going to pick on Christina Anderson just a little bit with the, the playing dead. 100% of that room got shot. Down here we had avoid and deny implemented. Less got shot, less perished. This room we had teamwork. We broke that social proof. Everyone worked together. They identified there was an issue. And they held the door shut with their feet. How they, did they stand there and kind of ninja kick the door shut? Probably not. Probably not. They probably laid on the ground and put their feet against the base of the door. Multiple people holding the door shut with their feet are going to defeat one person trying to push it open from the outside. The gunman still tried, didn't he? He shot through the door, didn't he? Nobody got hit. Why is that? If, if, if I think somebody's holding the door shut, where's the, the most likely place I'm going to try to shoot? By the doorknob. That's where the professor was probably holding the door shut like this, putting his weight against it, and the bullet penetrated the door and into, the, into him. Working together, laying on the ground, holding the door shut with their feet, gunshot still came through the door, but nobody got hit. So that tells us that you're not helpless in any situation and that what you do does matter. So now we're going to go through a scenario. We're going to put ourselves in a situation here today, a made up situation, and we're going to have a flow chart to explain what we're going to do. Now for argument's sake, those doors are our primary exit, okay? And for, today's, for the purpose of today's training, we're going to say we hear what we perceive to be gunshots in that foyer area out there. So that just occurred, so that's the, uh, the beginning of our attack. We ask ourselves, are our primary exits available to us? We hear them coming from there, are we going out those doors? No. If the answer is yes, if something is occurring over here and the answer is yes, we can go out those doors, we're going to immediately avoid the situation. Are we going to gather all of our belongings and make sure that we have our cell phone and make sure we have our purse and our this? No. We're going to get out just like when we were in school and we did a fire drill. We didn't gather our backpacks and we didn't gather all of our, our pencils and papers. We came back for them. We're going to avoid the situation if that's available to us. The answer is no, so we're going to deny access. Maybe take a belt, put it around the door closers, take uh, a belt and tie it to a chair or something, to, or a door that will prevent that, that from swinging open. Whatever we've put in place to prevent that door from opening, to keep the would-be attacker from gaining access to where we're at, we're going to do it. Once we've denied access to our location, are there other exits to this room? We've got one right there. We've got some windows here and in the back. Are those available to us? Yes, then we avoid the situation. Now, we gotta keep this situation going, so now we're gonna pretend that door doesn't exist. I've been in buildings that we didn't have that door, so that door doesn't exist and we cannot go out those doors and these windows are bulletproof glass. Got to throw a wrench in your spoke, sorry. <laughs> so we're going to say, no, they're not available to us. Now we've got to prepare ourselves to defend ourselves. Well, we've, we've denied access. We're done, right? No. What if they get through that barricade that we've put in place? We have to be prepared to take that next step. We have to be willing to take that next step. So there is our flow chart. There's the normal, or the, nothing's normal, there's the flow that we want to try to go by in a situation. Next we're going to talk about, <laughs> next we're going to talk about when law enforcement arrives on scene. Now, as you can tell, we're going to see the second part of the video from 
Panama City. Um, when law enforcement arrives on the scene, understand, like they said in the video, it's going to be a chaotic situation. There is no normal routine situation. It's not by the book or whatever. It never, never is. Are we all going to show up wearing the same uniform? No. Truth be told, Jason and I don't wear these uniforms every day. We wear these uniforms when we come teach these classes or do other, other presentations. Um, on a daily basis, our uniform is a green polo shirt and black BDU pants. That's what our, our unit wears. If we have a report of an active shooter, the, the uh, analogy of all hands on deck definitely kicks in. So that means all of our detectives that wear shirt and ties every day are going to be out there. That means they're going to probably show up wearing what we call an outer vest, a big bulky black vest that goes over top of your clothes, Velcro's in place, has all kind of pockets for the trinketry and gadgets that we carry, that we carry on, our, on our waist, but they're able to be carried on the vest. What about, remember I said I was part of the uh, aviation unit as a tactical flight officer. Who knows what the flight crew wears? You've seen a flight suit, right? <laughs> a flight suit is tactical pajamas. They're, they're a one, they're, remember the old pajamas we had when we were kids had the feet in them and the zipper that comes up? That's what they are, but they cut our feet off. We don't get the feet in them. We got to wear boots. But it's, it's a flight suit. It's olive drab green and it looks like children, like it's a body suit basically. Our marine guys, man, those guys have it made. They get to wear shorts and Columbia shirts. <laughs> That's like the perfect uniform, right? But they're still law enforcement officers. And we do have some undercover guys that, you know, get to grow their beard out and don't have to comb their hair in the morning and wear their shorts and t-shirts and Bahama, you know, Panama Jack sunglasses or whatever. So they fit in, but they're still law enforcement officers and they're going to have something on identifying themselves. The question always comes up, well, how do we know it's, if, if they're not wearing this uniform, how do we know they're really the police? Well, what are they saying? What are they doing? Just saying police, police, police doesn't mean they're the police. But if I'm a gunman bent on doing devastation, am I going to tell you to put your hands up? Am I going to tell you to get on the ground? Am I going to tell you, let me see your hands, don't move. You over there, drop what's in your hands. Am I going to probably be doing any talking? Probably not. If I'm looking for something and I tell you, get on the ground, show me your hands, this is the part of your hands I want to see. The palms. Why is that? Can I hide something like that? What about hiding this? Can this be anything dangerous to me? Absolutely. Remember, if you've watched some of the news reports about different active shooter events, uh, the Boston Marathon, what was that? That was detonated by? It was detonated by a cell phone. This could be a detonation device. So nothing in the hands. We're going to watch this video and listen to what they're saying, watch how they're moving, Watch what they're wearing. That, that kind of solidifies what I'm telling you. That guy's got the outer vest, but it must be cold out. He's got a hoodie, a little beanie cap, and a red shirt. Uh, shirt and tie. Shirt. That was the only one wearing a traditional law enforcement uniform, but there's that outer vest I was telling you about, shirt and tie, slacks, things like that. So it's not necessarily what they're saying or what they're wearing, it's what are they doing? How are they moving? What are they, what are they telling you to do? Understand that we get, when we get to a scene, we've got a priority of work. Now, 17 years ago, when I graduated the academy, a mere 22 years of age, he was, old. he's older though, he's older. When I was 22 years old, the, what did they pound into our heads in the academy? Your job is to protect and serve, right? So when we see somebody's hurt, we're supposed to help them, right? Doesn't apply to this situation. Why is that? Because we have to stop the killing first. 
When we walk into a situation and there are people that are hurt, been shot, been stabbed, whatever the case may be, injured because of an explosive device, we can't stop and render assistance to them until that threat is neutralized. The longer that threat goes unchallenged or unaddressed, the more victims that are going to be created. Our job is to run to the threat. Our job is to stop the threat by whatever means necessary. Then we stop the dying. What does that mean? That means the people that have been injured, we get them medical attention. We get them to a location where they can get that medical attention. And then we start evacuating the area of people that are not injured. This, all of this, does not take five minutes. Sometimes it takes us a while to get this done and get this started before we can get to here. Now that poses a problem for us. Well, let me finish this part first. When we get there, we want you to follow our commands and show us our palms. I explained to you why that is. If I, I can see, I can't hold something. If I have my hands like this, I can't fold my thumb backwards to hold this behind my hand. Unless it's taped to my hand, then I have to reach with this hand to get it. But we want to see that your palms are your hands because that's, that's what's dead, dangerous. That's what's deadly. And then don't move. Are you going to be upset and scared? Yes. Do I know you? No. Have we ever met? Do I know that you're not the bad guy? So when I come into the room and you come running at me screaming and I tell you to stop, 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 do I want to have to throw you on the ground or take deadly force actions? No, but do I know what your intentions are? Could you be the bad guy trying to get to me with a knife to stab me and you, you're pretending to be scared? Absolutely. So when we tell you to get on the ground, don't move, stay there, I get you're scared. We get it. Are you going to hear some bad language come out of our mouths? Possibly. Possibly. <laughs> Probably. Because we do come from the human race. And when we get excited, we say things that our grandmothers wouldn't be proud of. But I apologize for that. But listen to what we say. Do what we're telling you to do because we're going into this thing blind. We don't know who the bad guys are. That thing I told you about taking the time, it's going to take us the time to get through stopping the threat, identifying the injured persons and getting them to seek help. It's going to take a while for EMS to get in there. Are we going to allow EMS into a, what we call a hot situation or someplace where there's still active gunfire? No, because if they go in and get shot or get hurt, who's going to take care of them? People are going to need help. So then we've got this right here, the SEEK immediate first responder training. Can you guys do that? Absolutely. Let's say you get shot in the arm. How do we, sa how do we, we save somebody that's been shot in the arm? Do you have a tourniquet? No. Hmm? A belt. But, but, here's, but here's the great thing about today. Today we're filling that toolbox, right? I'm going to tell you that you can go online to Amazon, eBay, what's that website, Galls, a military surplus store, and you can buy a tourniquet. Then you can go on the internet to YouTube. You can learn anything on YouTube, <laughs> good and bad. You can go on to YouTube and learn how to apply that tourniquet. We have assigned to us, there's two different types of tourniquets we have floating around our agency. Um, we have what's called Cat 5, which is one that has a, winds, a wind, windlass that spins and applies additional pressure that's after it's Velcroed around and then it's put in place. Then we have one that's about four feet long, three and a half feet long, about four inches wide, and it's nothing more than a huge rubber band. Every year when we go to training, we have annual in-service training. Every year we practice putting this tourniquet on ourselves and on a partner. Does it feel good when you have a rubber band stretched tight around your leg and pull it? Not at all. You get it put on quick and you take it off even quicker. But you know how to put it on because we're, we're building that toolbox 
So we understand this is what I got to do. The, it was mentioned a belt. If, if you're in a situation where you don't have a tourniquet, you can use a belt, a purse strap, anything that you can put pressure on that wound. What types of wounds can you put a tourniquet on? Chest wound? No. A head wound? Do not put a tourniquet on me if I have a head wound. Because the only place, the only place you can put it is around the neck to get between the wound and the heart. And if you put it around the neck to cut the circulation off to the, to the wound, I'm not going to be able to, I'm not going to be able to breathe and I'm going to die. Arms, legs, appendage wounds, you can apply a tourniquet. The tourniquet goes between the wound and the heart. What about chest wounds? How do you, how do you package those? So, the sucking chest wound, you, you, you seal it on three sides. You don't seal it on the fourth side. But unless you've taken some type of training, you don't know these things. Now, interesting, um, the last time we taught this, we had someone from the fire department that said that they may be able to come out and start doing some brief first responder training for the people that come to our class. So we may take them up on that, may, may capitalize on that. But where can you go? Because the worst thing that can happen is you get into a situation where either you're hurt or a loved one's hurt and you're stuck in this room for a, a period of time while the investigation and the, the crime scene's being established and determined. Can you maybe, maybe arm yourself with certain things, some, some first aid equipment that you can put in your pocket or put in your purses, ladies, that if you're faced with these things, can you maybe contact the Red Cross? They'll do it for free. Can you maybe... Uh, go online and find some first responder training that you can go to? Absolutely, because that is again, excuse me, building your toolbox. That is again, adding to that Rolodex of information that you have that's gonna help you and help your loved ones out if you're ever faced with this. <clears throat> In any kind of tragedy or, uh, you know, natural disaster or whatever, uh, you have to expect that you're going to have some sort of mental trauma that comes from this. Have a plan in place. Um, where mental health is, uh, from where it was 20, 30 years ago, there are leaps and bounds beyond. There is no reason why anyone should suffer with PTSD, nightmares, survivor's guilt, or whatever, okay? Because there are uh, good treatments out there at least go one time after something like this or if you see a loved one suffering from something there's no reason for this to occur um, please make sure that they get some help if it's with a professional if it's with a clergy member or someone from your church have a plan in place ahead of time before any of this stuff ever happens talk about it um, and where will you go for that help PTSD is a real thing and us being in the field of law enforcement, uh, we like to say that I wish my brain could unsee the things that I've seen. And it's real, but you can survive and you can get better from these things. You're never going to forget what you saw, but you can be able to deal with it. Um, and there are strategies in place out there, so there's no reason to suffer with those, with those things going on. There's also one thing that we've discussed today, we've discussed a lot today as far as active shooters that have occurred and whatnot, but there's one thing that we have not discussed about any one of them. Does anybody have a clue? No one? Okay. At no point today have we ever named one of the shooters, okay? And nor should we ever do that. They should die anonymously as they lived because that is what they want. Like I said before, they want the fame, they want their names and lights. We shouldn't have to give them that, okay? Don't name them. I challenge every single one of you that when you see one of these things on TV, go out and learn a victim's name. Go out and learn a responder's name of someone that did something. Don't learn their name. The media is gonna do that for us. Um, and there are some countries where you'll never know who the shooter was because they're not allowed to put it out there. So be, uh, never name that, never name them and make sure you learn who the victims are. The question always comes up, 
and it's not something that we're going to dwell on too much. It's not something we're going to, going to um, discuss, but it, the question always comes up about concealed weapons carriers. If you have a concealed weapons permit, you have a concealed weapon, you're at a situation. If you take action, you don't take action, what should you do? <clears throat> this rings true for law enforcement officers who are off duty as well. Our policy at the Sheriff's Office is on duty, off duty, I always have a, my, my picture ID and a badge and a gun. Off duty, on duty, doesn't matter. I, I'm always armed. That's our policy, unless common sense dictates otherwise. Now, if I'm at a situation and I'm an off duty law enforcement officer and somebody comes in wearing this, guess what? It's their show. I did what I had to do while I was doing it and it's their show. Why is that? Well, it's not, I'm on, I'm on duty 24 seven, so it's not a fact that I'm off duty, but do they know who I am? I might be wearing, wearing shorts and a t-shirt and there are, believe it or not, there are people that work for the sheriff's office that I've, I, I don't know who they are. I've never met them. I, I don't interact with them on a daily basis. I don't even know their, I know their name just because I've seen it, but I couldn't put a name with a face. Just like if you're a concealed weapons permit carrier, there's not something over your head that says he's a good guy, that he's got a concealed weapons permit. And you can be yelling at me all day long, it's okay, I got a concealed weapons permit and you're holding a gun. What am I focused on? Yeah. The gun. Because I'm not hearing what you're saying. That audio exclusion is kicked in. So if you choose to be a concealed weapons carrier and you choose to en engage in a situation, know that when law enforcement gets there, do not have that gun in your hand because you are now perceived as a threat. Even if you're not using it in a threatening manner, put it down, get away from it, do exactly what we tell, hands up. Okay, just wanted to make sure we mentioned that part because it's not part of it, but the question always comes up at the end. I want to address it. So, let's discuss what we've discussed. Let's, let's summarize it. The, dis the disaster response philosophy, or psychology, what was that? That was the denial, deliberation, decisive moment. We want to get past that denial. We want to not let our brain outthink our gut. We want to say, there's something going on. It's not quite right. We need to figure it out. We need to get some action going. We want to deliberate on it. But before we can deliberate, we have to have something in that toolbox, something in that Rolodex, so to speak, that we can draw from. Once we're able to draw from that, hopefully we've thought about situations, not to be paranoid, but to be prepared. We want to think about situations to prepare ourselves for what if. And then if what if does happen, then we can take that decisive moment and put our plan into action. In that deliberation phase, we have our avoid, deny, defend. That's where we put that plan into place. That's where we decide, can we avoid the situation? If we can't avoid the situation, we immediately leave the area and go to a safe location, and then, and only then, do we call 911 and give the information that we know, not what we think. If we don't know, we don't guess. We tell them, I don't know. If we cannot avoid the situation, we have to deny access to our location. Now, Today is the time to think about what can we have in our place of employment or in our church or in our, uh, the places that we're going to be at as far as office spaces or whatever goes, classrooms if we're teachers, whatever the case may be, where if we are faced with something, we can have that there and it's readily accessible to us to, de to deny access to our room or to our location. And then we've denied access, but we, we, it doesn't stop there. We, we, they can't necessarily get in the room easily, but we're going to make it difficult for them to get in the room. But if they breach our barricade, if they breach while we fortified that door or that room, however we do it, we have to be ready to defend ourselves. Are there any rules in defending yourself? No, because at this point, we're, we're in a fight for our life and we have a legal obligation and, and legal right to defend ourselves and defend others. And that means by whatever means necessary. Then we discussed the Virginia Tech case study. We talked about that in depth. We saw how the two rooms that put the avoid, deny, defend into action, their, their casualty rate and injury rate were much less than the rooms that chose, or, or, or I won't say they chose not to, but they were unable to. And 
playing dead, did that work? Did that work for Christine Anderson? Well, it depends on what your definition of worked is. She got shot, but she's alive. She didn't die. But did jumping out a second story window work for the, the students in that other classroom? Did barricading the door with their feet work for that other classroom? Absolutely. So we want to remember that what you do matters and you're not helpless in these situations, but now's the time to think about it. Now's the time to prepare your mind and to what we're going to say, input that information into the Rolodex or put those tools into the toolbox. Think critically when you're watching the news. Run what if scenarios through your mind when you're watching the news or driving down the road or when you go to the grocery store. Don't be paranoid, but be prepared. Before we let you go, we got one other, one other thing I'm going to bring to your attention. Um, one of the ladies mentioned to me today that she's graduated from our Citizens Academy and is going to do her ride along tonight, which is great. Um, got a whole group, all right. Um, they, they will be our spokesperson at the end of the class, so if you want to talk to them and get some ideas or whether you should participate in this, this program, but we do have the Citizens Academy at the Sheriff's Office. And first and foremost, let me say that the price is great. It's equal to the price you paid to come here today. Free. If anybody charged you, make sure I know so I can collect that money. Just kidding. Uh, it's, it's free to the public. Um, it's a, how, how many weeks was it? Eight weeks. Okay. It used to be six weeks. We added two weeks to it. So it's an eight week program now uh, where you get to sit at the sheriff's office and learn from the people that do the job what they do. By that, I mean the forensics unit, a representative from the forensics unit comes out and tells you what forensics does. They won't have me teaching you forensics. I can, I can dust for fingerprints, but they're the experts. They talk. Now they'll have somebody from our unit come out and tell what community policing does but they don't, they don't have the community policing unit teach you about aviation, nor do they have them teach you about canine or forensics. It's the people that work in those areas tell you what they do. A lot of times they dispel some misconceptions of what they're able to do, but a lot of times they, they really impress you with what they can do that a lot of people don't realize. So if that's something that you're interested in, again, it's free. It's held at the sheriff's office for eight weeks. Um, we just finished up a class. There'll be another one starting pretty soon. Just keep an eye on our website where you sign up for this class. That's where they advertise the Citizens Academy. And speak to the group back there. They just finished it up. I love the aviation and the mountain. I've been through the academy. You've been through the academy? So, and I've never talked to an individual that's gone through the Citizens Academy that didn't say that they learned something and didn't say they enjoyed it. So Excellent. we encourage you to tell your friends and family about this class. Take the video back to them. Again, it's Avoid, Deny, Defend. Look it up on, on YouTube. Let them watch the video. If they're interested, this class is held twice a month. You guys have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>